Good morning. It is my great pleasure to share with you an interview with biblical scholar Robert M. Price on the subject of Jehovah's Witnesses. I do have a few brief disclaimers. First of all, if you're not comfortable considering the possibility that Jehovah's Witnesses might actually be right about some things, then you might not be ready for this video. I remember when I was fresh out of the organization, I felt most comfortable with the notion that they were wrong about everything. That felt comforting. I now realize that's not rational, but I understand. Secondly, if you are a Christian who believes in the inerrancy of Scripture, this video might not be for you. And finally, this is my first attempt at doing something like this, and the poorness of my equipment and lack of experience is quite apparent. I especially want to acknowledge that there are some odd edits that were not intentional. For some reason, the camera would stop recording for no reason, no apparent reason. And the first time it happened, we tried to pick up where we left off, sort of, without knowing exactly where it had stopped. After that, we just, uh, my partner Emily, just kept hitting record whenever, whenever it would stop recording. So again, there are some odd edits, and I apologize for that. Thankfully, there's a nice long stretch at the end of the video where Robert Price has an uninterrupted tirade where he makes so many excellent points. It's the highlight of the video for me. The main takeaway from our entire exchange for me is that truth is much more about a willingness to speculate about the unknowns than it is about dogma. But with no further ado, I give you Dr. Robert Price. Um, we met yesterday, but uh, could you share who you are and your credentials a little bit? Uh, well, I am, uh, let's see now, I guess I majored in uh, religion, history, and uh, um, minored in classics at Montclair State College, and then went on to Gordon Conwell Seminary, where I did not take ministerial courses, but took almost nothing but New Testament uh, classes. Then I uh, went immediately to Drew University and started a PhD program in systematic theology. I uh, finished that in uh, three years in the dissertation called The Crisis of Biblical Authority. It was based on uh, sort of um, outlining five approaches to biblical authority by evangelicals who had rejected inerrancy. So like, well, how else did they construe it? Uh, that was published by Prometheus years later. Then, um, ooh, let's see, I taught for some years shortly after that, and then um, uh, pastored a very liberal sort of Baptist church. And uh, despite what some people say, I was never a fundamentalist preacher. Uh, by the time I was a uh, pastor, I was into... Uh, Tillich and Bultmann, Schleiermacher, and then uh, shortly thereafter, religious humanism. While I was at, at the, that church, I uh, began a second PhD program, again at Drew University, uh, this time in New Testament, and finished that in three years. And then my dissertation was The Widow Traditions in Luke Acts, and uh, uh, it was all just really a thrill. I loved uh, every minute of it. and. Uh, I, um, well, I, in terms of teaching, I, I taught at uh, Mount Olive College in North Carolina and uh, uh, adjunct it all over the place uh, earlier than that and uh, was on the faculty, a temporary thing at Drew University. I moved down uh, to North Carolina again and um, taught. Uh, a bit at the local community college and then taught online for Johnny Coleman Seminary, a new thought outfit. And uh, <clears throat> now I really don't teach formally at all. I just do the Bible Geek podcasts and write books. Okay, very good. So what I want to talk about today is Jehovah's Witnesses. That's mm -hmm. my background. Could you give just your general impression of Jehovah's Witnesses briefly? Well, uh, I've never known any but very nice uh, people in it, but I haven't been able to escape the, the sense that, the, uh, that it is a true cult uh, in the sense that, uh, that they're control freaks at the top and uh, that it's uh, oppressive. And, uh, and 
I, I don't want to, but though on the other hand, what people have to do, the door-to-door -door witnessing and all that, I did some of that when sure. I was there earlier, and, and I have always felt these people have a lot of guts. Yes. Uh, just like Pentecostals speaking in tongues, they can't help but find that embarrassing initially, but they figure that's what they ought to do to be faithful to the Bible, and I, I uh, have great respect for them, so same thing here. Um, I've, I guess my main interest in the witnesses would be, well, there's the, the eschatological embarrassments, the, the, their classic instance of when prophecy fails, they're setting up there. They're much like Al Gore predicting the end of the world by so and so, no polar ice caps anymore by 2009, and all this chicken little hysteria. Uh, well, the witnesses almost uh, invented that. I shouldn't say that, I mean, just in terms of modern groups that's been going on in the whole history of it. I think they kind of borrowed it from the Millerite. Yeah, yeah. Kind of replayed it a few times. Mm -hmm. And now let's not forget the Latter Day Saints, uh, right. same mm -hmm. deal. Um, but um, I've, uh, I've uh, also admired in the witnesses the uh, willingness, starting with uh, Russell, to uh, re-examine everything in the Bible. And uh, sometimes I, I don't agree with what they come up with simply because they're hobbled by the working assumption that the Bible has to agree with itself. That, uh, that So you have to make a system out of it. And, uh, and then you're juggling contradictory passages and ironing them out uh, so they look like each other. But there are several places where they came up with a reading of uh, this or that text, important ones that I think are probably the, the author's intent, like uh, um, John 1.1, 1, 1, the word was a God. That's entirely legitimate, though there's no way to know if that's the, the intent because of the grammar uh, mess that uh, the God is a uh, predicate nominative and uh, even if it meant the same as the God uh, in the first part of the sentence, uh, you wouldn't necessarily have a definite article and so you don't know if it's supposed to mean was God or was a God, but their, their reading of it is certainly legitimate and I, I kind of think they're right based on the wisdom, uh, capital W, uh, and Lagos background of Jewish thought. So I've heard you speak favorably about the New World Translation um, on the Bible Geek and in our conversation um, because the translators were willing to look, re look at these doctrines and kind of throw orthodoxy out and take a fresh look mm -hmm. at scripture. Um, but I, I was wondering if I could get your thoughts on a couple areas where I feel that they've kind of introduced their own biases mm -hmm. into the translation. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses latch on to verses in the Old Testament about the Promised Land, such as uh, Psalm 37 is their favorite. Mm. And they use that as proof that the hope for Christians is everlasting life on a paradise earth. So, with that in mind, at Luke 23, when Jesus says to the man next to him, Truly I tell you today, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. They explicitly say that he's referring to the man being resurrected in the future to a paradise earth. Um, and where they insert the comma in that sentence mm. is, is the way that they try to drive that message home. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, if that's what is intended, it's too bad it didn't say, uh, uh, today I say to you, uh, rather than I say to you today. Uh, since uh, Jesus introduces statements all over the Gospels with truly I say to you, or even truly, truly I say to you, uh, but there is never uh, a today, I mean that that would have been, made sense, it uh, would have uh, been appropriate, but uh, since that's, uh, that would be the only recorded instance, it seems improbable to me. Uh, and. Uh, it, uh, and the, to read it, I mean, it's obvious they're trying to shoehorn an um, eschatology into that verse that is, uh, seems to me, really extraneous. That he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Uh, and, well, what does that mean? Your kingly power, it might, or those, a place in heaven. It seems to mean that. And Jesus says, well, today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, and uh, I just, uh, you, you can't tell. I mean, you, 
can't get a seance and get Luke in the room and go, what did you mean? <laughs> but uh, it's, it seems to me uh, that's really dragging in an extraneous issue. Extraneous issue. Why do they go with the psalm when it, it's very clear in the book of Revelation that the redeemed will live on earth with God with uh, no temple and so forth? I mean, that's explicit. Well, they, they certainly draw in Revelation as well. Maybe you can talk a little bit about your thoughts on what, what the new heavens and the new earth. Mm. Um, but they, they, they say that there's a, a, a large group of Christians who aren't ever going to heaven. Mm. They're just going to live through on the earth. Mm. Um, do you feel that there's, that that's, when you read the scriptures, is that the impression you get about Christians, that they are going to be not going to heaven, that there are some Christians that won't go to heaven? Well, um, to even put it that way is already a harmonization. Uh, it's uh, because it never splits up uh, Christians into groups that way, with the one exception again in Revelation, where it says that there, there are the souls of the martyrs conscious in heaven already. And uh, they're waiting for vindication, which they then get when Christ returns. And uh, the, the martyrs uh, of the beast rise up and they reign with Christ for a thousand years from Jerusalem, the camp of the saints. And the rest of the righteous are cool in their heels uh, for, for a thousand years when you have the books opened and the wicked and the righteous come forth to face the music. And, uh, and then it says that uh, henceforth, after the new heaven and new earth, uh, that uh, God has made his dwelling among men. Uh, and um, it seems to me, uh, I mean, unless you had some statement uh, to the contrary in the text, it would sure seem that all Christians are there. What God is yeah. going to be on earth, and and some Christians are going to be in heaven looking for him. Where do you go? Uh, it, it just seems like you you can't. Uh, uh, I, I don't think there's any distinction like that anywhere in the Bible. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, the, the, somebody gets preferential treatment, the, the martyrs reign with Christ, sure. but then that's uh, concluded when everybody uh, joins the party. Yeah, right. Um, so another verse, or another thing that often gets criticized about the New World Translation is the way they translate, I forget what the Greek word is, but it, it's, it's generally translated as worship, hmm. and whenever it's used in reference to Jesus, the people before Jesus, they translate it obeisance, hmm. and so and they don't do it consistently. So there's other times when it'll say worship, uh -huh. and then when it's referring to people before Jesus, it's obeisance. Mm -hmm. Have you looked into that at all, or have any thoughts about that? Well, I, there's latria, which means to serve, and uh, could mean worship, and there's uh, proskuneo, which means, I think, mean, literally to kneel before, and there is ambiguity in that. Like, I don't think the... Uh, the, the wise men are supposed to be worshiping the infant Jesus. Uh, they, um, though that's not impossible, uh, but uh, in a similar story that this is probably based on, uh, I think it's Tiridates comes from uh, the Parthian Empire to revere Nero at his coronation and speaks of him as my god. So it, it's possible it means that, but it's always seemed to me it just means that they kneel before him to swear fealty. Mm -hmm. Or when uh, uh, Satan says to Jesus, it, it, "All these shall be yours if you what uh, proskuneo? If if Jesus becomes a Satanist and starts sacrificing infants, or no, then it, it's clearly it means bow before me, swear fealty to me. An ambiguous word. You just mm -hmm. have to go by context. Sure. Um, another thought: Jehovah's Witnesses put a huge amount of importance on the name Jehovah." Of course, mm. and they claim that they have correctly restored the name of the name to the New Testament. I think 237 times. Um, however, there are no manuscripts of the Christian Greek scriptures that contain the Tetragrammaton. So, is there any evidence for a conspiracy during the what they call the Great Apostasy mm. to remove the divine name from all the all of the Greek scriptures? I don't think so, but I, I'm guessing that. Uh, they're thinking about how it's only Christian copies of the Septuagint that replace the, the divine name with Kurios, uh, and that, that we have some 
Jewish copies where uh, it, it does just have transliterated. Yeah, that's and, what they point to. And I'm guessing that, and I think they may have been the first to point that out, but uh, th that doesn't, I mean, that would make sense if the same thing had been done in the New Testament, but I don't think there's any manuscript evidence that it was. And it would seem to me that, uh, so it's not an absurd notion, but it seems uh, gratuitous, uh, purely speculative. And if it were true, wouldn't they have a bit of a problem since uh, uh, Jesus is the kurios Jesus? Uh, are they, would that make him Jehovah? Uh, so, which, uh, you know, might be the case. Margaret Barker argues that Jesus is supposed to be in the Old Testament. And, uh, but I don't think they'd like that. That's not their theology. So I, I don't know. They may have an answer to that. I, I've never looked into it in detail what they think about it in particular. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, so there's certain beliefs that are core to Jehovah's Witnesses that are actually the rejection of beliefs, and they really hold them dear to their hearts. So they reject the Trinity, which we've kind of been alluding to here. They reject hellfire. They reject, they reject the immortal soul. And they, they look at these, these doctrines, and they see them in pre-Christian religions. And, and maybe you can speak a little bit, too, if, if some of those did filter into the Bible. But what I'm really interested in hearing you say is... So they've eliminated some things that have pagan or pre-Christian origin. Are there other things that we have in Orthodox Christianity that would be in common with Jehovah's Witnesses that are just, it's all pagan? I mean, that this all comes from pre-Christian religions that filtered its way into our Bible today. Well, I don't think it had much of Christian doctrine at all if it hadn't come out of Zoroastrianism uh, during the exile, where it, uh, it usually scholars say that that uh, Jews were um, influenced by Zoroastrianism, which they encountered during the exile, and thought, "Hey, this Atraman thing—that would be a pretty good way of getting God off the hook. Let's change Satan, God's agent, into." Um, the the arch enemy of God, like Ahriman is to Uhura Mazda, but it now uh, looks more like, uh, you know how it says that Ezra was a scribe in the service of the Persian government and that he came back to uh, to um, the, the Holy Land with the law of God in his hand and so on. It, it appears more likely to me uh, and, and to some others that uh, Basically, the post-exilic religion of Judaism is a kind of Judaized Zoroastrianism, and that, in fact, the Pharisees, the major ones that adhered to all those doctrines, a future Messiah, a resurrection from the dead, uh, Satan as the enemy of God, uh, an elaborate angelology, and so on, that uh, these guys were called by the Sadducees Pharisees, denoting Parsees or Persians, uh, that they were the heretics, but they had more esteem among the common people. And the Sadducees' power base was in the temple. When it was destroyed, the, the Pharisees pretty much uh, filled the vacuum, and, and that became Orthodox Judaism. But if not for Zoroastrianism, there'd be no recognizable Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, because all of that is fundamental to them. You don't have the resurrection of the Old Testament. And uh, I mean, barely you do, but that's in very late post-exilic uh, material. Uh, and um, so there's almost all of it comes from earlier things. And uh, that's the, the, what is the problem with that? I mean, even theologically, if you say God is not without his witness, uh, no pun intended, uh, then uh, you, and the Greek Orthodox Church viewed it this way with uh, Platonic philosophy. They said, well, this guy was a Christian before Christ, like uh, Justin Martyr said about Socrates, and he was working with these people. And so when that enters the, the uh, river of Christian theology, uh, you know, why not? What's the problem? God was at work there. Well, I don't know why you couldn't do the same thing with the mystery religions, uh, with the uh, uh, sacramental salvation and all that. I, I don't see what the problem is. And in fact, Gnosticism, uh, one of the theories is that that is a form of Platonized Judaism, yeah. 
Uh, so what the heck's the big deal seeing that in the New Testament? So if you try to just strip out the, it's almost like a theological ethnic cleansing. You're trying to get rid of everything. That, what, what do you want, an ancient Israelite religion, uh, like back in the time of Samuel or something? I mean, would that be the true religion? Uh, it just seems to me you, you can't. It's like, I've had just like the the wheat and the tares parable. Mm. If you get rid of all the tares, you're not going to have anything left. You'll have destroyed the whole thing. And uh, that's uh, that's so common to all uh, biblicists that they, they have that that approach. The hell thing comes from, uh, in all probability, from the geography of Sicily with its uh, hell mouths, the lava pits and fumaroles and volcanoes and so on. It looks like that imagery for a, a, a bad afterlife originated with Sicilian neo-Pythagorean philosophers who fanned out all over the Mediterranean preaching and that that's where, that's where that came from because there's no fiery hell of punishment in the Old Testament right. and it never comes up in the Pauline epistles. Yeah. It's funny people say that, Jesus, boy, he was, a, a, he was gentle Jesus, meek and mild, but Paul, oh, what a fierce character. No matter who you think wrote him, the so-called Pauline epistles never yeah. mention anybody going to hell, whereas Jesus is made to say, oh yeah, you know, Hades, but that brings up the soul thing. Uh, Jesus says, I'll tell you who to fear. Don't fear those who only can kill the body and can do nothing after that. I tell you, fear him who can cast both body and soul into Hades. Mm -hmm. uh, what's that supposed to mean if there's no soul? The, I, I grant there are Bible passages, New Testament passages that speak of the dead as those who are asleep. Right. And that would suggest to me the, the soul sleep or conditional immortality or whatever you want to call it. But there's Which was the Jewish idea before Zoroastrian came in, right? Uh, apparently, yeah. They, uh, though they also seem to have adopted the Babylonian idea of Sheol, which is pretty much the same as the Greek Hades, just a kind of a uh, eternal... Uh, dingy bus station uh, that you, right. you weren't being tormented or anything yeah. that you were just warehoused there yeah. and uh, but that's that may just have been a metaphor for being dead like the uh, the uh, like Psalm 90 and uh, Genesis 3 presuppose you're just dead yeah. dust to dust right. Uh, so, I mean, if, if it really mattered that there was an afterlife and the prospect of, of eternal torment, don't you think we'd have heard about it uh, back in Old Testament times? A big surprise in store. Uh, but the, <laughs> it's certainly hell is not even universal in the New Testament. I already mentioned Paul, but uh, there's a, is there a resurrection of the wicked? Well, according to Acts and Revelation, yes, but according to 1 Corinthians 15, apparently no. Uh, the resurrection simply means salvation. The wicked are dead. Christ comes to raise those who are his, and that's the end, it says. So you, you just can't assume that the, everybody in the single early church had the same views. That's the, What that's doing is to refashion the past as a model for what you want the present to be. Yeah. Uh, and it's always been that because y you have to be an idiot to read the New Testament and get the idea that all Christians agreed. They're, I mean, look at the epistles. Oh, they, these guys have made shipwreck of their faith because they believe this about the rest. Uh, it's, it's just uh, ridiculous. And of course, the next step is to posit an authority structure back then, a magisterium or something that the apostles wouldn't have allowed uh, these these idea, these heresies to grow up. It's just like the historical Jesus apologetics thing, where they say they say. Uh, Oh, the, everything that says Jesus said and did in the Gospels, he did because the apostles would never have allowed the, the tradition to be polluted. What were they, they uh, con, were they a bunch of, uh, it was like Snopes.com? <laughs> were, were these guys, did they have anything better to do than, than constantly, as, like the federal revenuers go into every every village where there were Christians and listening in and taping what they said. And I'm sorry, Jesus didn't say 80 times. you got to forgive him 70 times. Or, uh, and it's just ridiculous, and it's just a way of saying, yeah, they, were, they always believe what we believe. And unless you got a time machine in your garage, there's no way to verify that. And even then you couldn't. You couldn't cover all the ground and talk to everybody.
Yeah. Wow, you sure you, you covered a, a, most of my remaining questions there. <laughs> that was excellent. Because um, Jehovah's Witnesses do have that picture in their mind of perfect unity in the first century, and then everything got screwed up mm. because of the great apostasy, and then you had the, you mentioned the wheat and the, the weeds. Mm. Uh, you know, the, there was all weeds, and then all of a sudden the weeds became apparent, and that was the Jehovah's mm. Witnesses, of course, and they replicated first century Christianity. They decoded the Bible and used scripture mm. to interpret scripture. Which means interpret the ones you don't like and in light of the ones you do like. Right, exactly. Uh, of course, they're right about there being a great apostasy, and that uh, with Constantine mm. and uh, an official version, I mean, that's certainly correct. I don't think anybody. Uh, doubts that, except for the, maybe the Roman Catholics in the Eastern right. Orthodox, that's a lot of people, but still it's, it's not just some sectarian claim there, right. they're right about that. And uh, as I say, I think they're right about a, a number of scripture passages, but I, I think it's important to remember that just because you think they've made some good calls, that doesn't mean that everything they say is true. Yeah. Uh, that as, as a, this must be the right institution, I gotta belong to this one because they're uniquely right. It's the luck of the draw. I mean, everybody's got uh, some correct judgments on interpreting the Bible or something like that, but that doesn't mean you're stuck with them. Why not do what Russell did and start your own thing, hang out your own shingle based on your opinions? Yeah. There's a, there's a passage where it says that the, the, the road to life is, is narrow and the road to destruction is broad and spacious. And I like to think of that as Russell was trying to create a narrow path mm -hmm. and what we have now is a broad road to destruction when you look at the organization now where people are just following mindlessly mm. rather than kind of figuring things out for themselves. Yeah. Jerry Falwell once said, a good Christian, like a good soldier, doesn't ask any questions. Uh, that's nefarious, because uh, bit like Billy Graham once said, God has no grandsons. If your faith is simply a, a parroting what you've been told, you don't really have your own faith. Uh, the whole idea, though I don't really buy it, of the personal savior thing, and that's something that's not in the Bible. Uh, if But if you want to go that way, doesn't that mean you have to make your own decision and evaluation? You can't just be catechized into it. They're right about that. Um, but uh, in fact, they do catechize people and uh, you've got to, you're not saved by moral works, but you're saved by cognitive works. Unless you believe all the things on the checklist, you're going to hell. Oh, I believe in Jesus, but boy, I'm not that sure about the inerrancy of the Bible. You're out of here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, one more question. Uh, this is actually coming from a friend. He suggested this as a question. Is where, where, um, were there any missing books of doctrine in the Bible? Because the Bible feels like a story where we're walking halfway into a conversation with the characters discussing doctrines among themselves, and all we get are snippets. Where are the books where they learn all the teachings they are expected to believe. The you mean the uh, uh, like the what these things that are not explicitly attested, um, but the church teaches are apostolic or. Um, I think so. Yeah. I mean, is this coming from oral traditions or? Uh, no doubt. Like the Catholics are are. Uh, well, they think that the apostles wrote the New Testament or, or sidekicks of the apostles. It wasn't Batman, but Robin, that's close enough if he wrote the Gospel of Rome. Uh, and uh, that the Catholics say, well, okay, the, the, we have apostolic teaching in the New Testament, but it's obvious these guys would have had plenty more to say. Uh, and yeah, that, that's a good point. But like Martin Luther said, there's no way to know what it was now. Uh, there's just uh, the stream is too polluted, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but I think you, you have within the New Testament competing, clashing views, and that does, like the Gospel of John, it's, it looks to me like a volleyball game, Christologically, that uh, you have, for instance, these incredible statements like uh, John 14, somewhere in there. Uh, Philip says, uh, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough. And he says, what, I've been with you so long, you still don't recognize me? Philip, whoever is seen me has seen the Father. Uh, that's what you call modalism or patropassianism. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is God the Father. Uh, and then the, what's Jesus say next? 
Or don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? What? To me, that sounds like scribal backpedaling. Somebody said, oh, wait a minute, this is too strong. Let's see if we can water it down a little bit. Uh, and, and there's a lot of stuff like that in John. It does, doesn't have a consistent view. Was Jesus a flesh and blood human being? Oh, it sure says he was. Uh, the word became flesh and all that. But then you look closer at, at the passages. You see, Jesus said, uh, I thirst on the cross. Who wouldn't? Well, it's then it goes on to say he said this in order to fulfill scripture. It was like lines in a play. Uh, or he sends in chapter 4 the disciples to uh, go to the local deli in Samaria and, and bring some food back uh, and he asks the woman for a drink of water but then he doesn't drink it and it's just a, a platform to say well I could give you the water of eternal life etc and when they come back with the groceries they say, eat master and he says I have food to eat that you know not of what is this is uh, is this real incarnation or not and uh, so what's going on or the uh, first epistle of John, there is perfectionism. Whoever is born of God doesn't sin because he can't sin. But then it says, if anybody commits a mortal sin, uh, give up on him. You, you can't do anything about it. But uh, short of that, if we confess our sins, he forgets, which is it? Is it impossible to sin or not? Either the guy that wrote this was a multiple personality, or we have scribal corrections. They, they didn't dare take stuff out of the text, but they figured they could misdirect the reader by saying, oh, well, it doesn't really mean that because take a look over here. And so I think you're reading debates uh, within the, the text. Paul seems to denounce Gnosticism in one chapter of 1 Corinthians and then embrace it in the next one. Yeah. Uh, women can't speak here, but they can in this other chapter of the same book. Uh, what is this? And it seems to me uh, these uh, these books are patchwork quilts that that do like the scrapbooks of different factions in the New Testament period. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So it's it's a book that's fun to to research and mm. try to unpack the way you're doing. The problem is when somebody tries to latch on to one interpretation and say this is the right one, and if you disagree, and the with whole it, thing has to be subordinated to that because of this no. this insidious theological assumption that God is the author of scripture and he wouldn't contradict himself. Look, uh, there could be such a book, but it isn't this one. Right. Uh, this is obviously not that. And to try to dress it up and make it look that way, it, it's just, it's like the theologians are like political spin doctors uh, that, oh, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, said that she's for open borders, but she didn't really mean that. She meant this and uh, uh, all that stuff. It's just sickening to see people uh, obsequiously uh, trying to pull the wool over your eyes and theologians who say they believe in the one who says I am the truth they don't care about the truth they just care about the party line right. and you can sympathize because they think if they don't they're going to fry in hell right um it's like pastors who often can't say what they think or they lose their job. And uh, you can't really blame them. Uh, integrity matters, but if you got a family to feed, uh, it's, it's a real mess. But that's the way the world is. Yeah, well, I hope we can work through it at some point and I'll think a little more like you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for taking time. Oh, my pleasure. I appreciate it. Mm. <laughs> so, that's the actual interview but I want to share a few more details with you. If it seemed like I was a little rushed, it's because I had to finish in time for Dr. Price to get to his next interview. My interview was shot at his hotel room and from there we went down to the hotel lobby. But as I packed up my camera, I brought up the Jehovah's Witness understanding of the passage in Matthew about the faithful and discreet slave. As you may remember, Jehovah's Witnesses have Matthew chapter 24 and 25 all wrapped up in describing their supposed anointed remnant in 1914 and giving the impression that Christ chose them specifically. And this includes the parable of the discreet virgins, the parable of the talents, where those who invested their talents were called good and faithful slave, as well as the passage about feeding and clothing Christ's brothers at the end of chapter 25 there. And Watchtower references for all of this will be in the description below. As it turns out, the parable about the talents is one of Bob Price's favorite passages because he sees it as a parable 
about using your life well, being productive instead of just wasting your life playing video games. So he said that the Watchtower interpretation was, quote, outrageous. And it's shortly after he said that, that the following video that you're about to see picks up. Thankfully, Emily had the wherewithal to hit record on her phone on the way down to the lobby. So enjoy. Did scientific research, I helped the poor, uh, this and that. And, okay, that's just what I was hoping for. Uh, and uh, I mean, clearly, it's not especially theological even. Yeah. Uh, what have you done with your life? Uh, the guy that gave it to you is gonna wanna know uh, what you did with it. I wish I brought it up because I love your response. And they, they actually tie it in with the verses where it talks about um, when did we when did we see you naked and not clothe you? When did we see you thirsty? And it says when you didn't do it to the least of these my least my brothers, you didn't do it to me. And they take that to mean that the least of these my brothers is is the upper class of Christians, and we clothe them and oh, bring them water that's by ridiculous. obeying them. That's ridiculous. Uh, it 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 almost certainly has reference to the the early Christian missionaries that. Uh, the, uh, but this witness thing that that's just ludicrous. I might have to. I might have to see if I can pin you down, even for just to like hold somebody hold my phone and uh, interview. <laughs> it just ask that question and throw that in at the end of the video because that is the core belief of Jones. But that their that their governing body is the faithful oh, and slave. That's revolting. <laughs> mm. I'm glad you have such a visceral reaction. Try to hold on to that for one next day. Boy, is that manipulative. Huh? priestcraft if there ever was such a thing. I love that. Manipulative priestcraft indeed. Now, I couldn't resist following up on our conversation with a lengthy email to him with all the applicable Watchtower references. And I've reproduced that email in its entirety in the description below. But I would like to conclude this video with Bob's email response to me. O oh, Prophet Daniel, it is obvious that we have here the shamelessly self-serving rationale for a group arrogating to themselves power and privilege, a kind of dictatorship of the proletariat. The whole business is strikingly like the Dead Sea Scrolls Habakkuk commentary, with an isolated, paranoid sect of zealots viewing themselves as the righteous remnant, with the result that scripture must be interpreted as applying to, and predicting, them only. And the group must be run by an enlightened elite who alone can rightly interpret scripture, thus enhancing their own self-appointed clout. Pathetic. Bob. That is the extent of my exchange with Robert Price up to this point. I hope you have found it as enjoyable as I did, and thank you for watching.